Last summer, my family and I rented an Airbnb, a cozy spot tucked away in the woods. Seemed like the perfect escape. So there we were, unloading our bags, the kids already bickering about who'd get which room. Typical family stuff, right? But then, my wife, she's got this quizzical look on her face as she's fiddling with the door to the patio. Honey, this is weird, she calls out to me, and I'm like, what's up? So she shows me this lock on the inside of the door, and I'm thinking, okay, safety first, no biggie. But then she points to another lock, on the same door, but this one's on the outside. Now I'm scratching my head trying to make sense of it. Why'd you need a lock on both sides of a door? It's strange, but I brush it off, maybe some quirky old house thing. So we carry on, unpacking, settling in. Dinner time rolls around and I'm heading out to fetch some firewood from the shed out back. I reach for the door and guess what? It's locked, from the outside. My wife sees my face, she knows something's off. The kids sense it too, their laughter fades. We're all sharing these glances like, what's going on here? It's that sinking realization, the kind that starts in your gut and just freezes you. I try to keep it together, not to freak everyone out, but inside, my mind's racing. We're trapped. And I couldn't shake this creeping feeling that we were meant to find out. Just not yet. As night falls, this house, it's like it starts to change. We're all huddled in the living room, wrapped in blankets, trying to watch some show to distract ourselves. But it's tough. Every little noise has us jumpy, eyes darting around. The kids, they're picking up on it too. My youngest, he's got his face buried in my wife's side, whispering, Daddy, there's someone else here. I can hear them walking. That's when I hear it. A floorboard creaks upstairs. Not the random creak of an old house. No, this was different. Deliberate. We all froze. The kid's eyes are wide as saucers, and my wife, she's got this grip on my arm like a vice. That sound wasn't just our overactive imaginations. It was real, unmistakably real. And then, out of nowhere, there's this scent, a weird, metallic sort of smell. My wife gives me this look like, do you smell that? And I nod, trying to place where I've caught that scent before. And then it hits me. Blood. It smells like blood. There's a quiet moment, and then my eldest, she points towards the hallway. There, casting a long shadow, is this figure, just standing there, still as a statue, watching us. Hearts pounding, I muster up the courage to call out, asking, Who are you? No answer, just that lingering, heavy silence. The figure steps forward, light from the TV catching just enough of his face, a twisted smile. Evening, folks, he says, voice dripping with malice. Let's play a game, he continues. The rules are simple. Stay alive until sunrise and you're free to go, but if I catch any of you, well, I'm sure you can guess. We're paralyzed, trapped in this nightmare. My wife's clutching the kids close, eyes darting around for an exit, a weapon, anything, and I'm thinking, how do we get out of this? How do we keep him from getting to us? The intruder seems to enjoy our panic, taking in each of our terrified faces. Tick-tock, he murmurs, taking a step closer. The gravity of the situation sinks in. This isn't just a game to him, it's a hunt, and we've just become the prey in his twisted sport. There we are, back against the wall, this psychopath inching closer. I'm looking at my family, their faces ghost white with terror. Not like this, I think. Not here. Not now. I lunge forward, sheer desperation driving me. I see my wife, her face white with terror, the kids clinging to her. My mind screaming, keep him away from the family. It's not about winning, it's about surviving. It's raw, primal fear fueling me, every hit, every block, I'm fighting for our lives. But he's strong, terrifyingly so. In the chaos, I spot a glimmer, keys dropped in the scuffle. I lunge, our hands scrabble, and then, with a surge of strength, I shove him back. His head hits the wall with a sickening crack. I'm grabbing the kids, my wife's right behind us, and we stumble out the front door. We're sprinting, every ounce of energy focused on putting distance between us and that hellhole. The kids are crying, gasping for air. We don't stop until we reach the neighbor's house, pounding on the door like madmen. The look on their faces when they see us, it's a mix of shock and horror. Words tumble out a jumbled mess of fear and relief as I'm trying to catch my breath. The police are called. 
Turns out the guy was wanted in three states. A suspected serial killer and those locks, they were his sick way of making sure his playthings didn't escape. Weeks pass and life slowly starts to find its rhythm again. But those nights, the fear, the desperation, I can't shake them. They linger, haunting the edges of our everyday life. My wife and I, we'd been grinding nonstop, you know, the nine to five hustle that just wears you down. So when we stumbled upon this deal for a weekend at a mansion, it seemed like a no-brainer. The drive up was pretty scenic. It was one of those routes lined with trees so tall they kind of make you feel small. And then, there it was, the mansion. This place was the definition of grandiose, tucked away from the world, like it held secrets only the woods could tell. We were all laughs and smiles walking up to that grand old door, expecting a weekend of luxury. Stepping inside, it was like we'd punched a ticket to the past. Everything was, I don't know, pristine but ancient, the kind of place where you half expect to see a butler pop out asking if you want afternoon tea. First things first, though, we decided to explore. Every room was like a snapshot from an old movie. Rich drapes, creaky wooden floors, portraits of folks who looked like they hadn't cracked a smile in a century. My wife joked about us living like royalty, but as she twirled around the room in delight, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, was watching us. So night falls, and we're in the dining room that's probably seen more history than my entire apartment building. We'd brought along this fancy bottle of wine, saving it for a special occasion. And if waking up in a mansion doesn't scream special occasion, I don't know what does. We're toasting to love, life, and getting away from it all when I first feel it. It's like the air turned cold, just for a second, like someone had left a window open. But all the windows were shut, the curtains drawn. As we make our way to bed, that's when I notice it. A picture frame on the wall turned face down, I didn't remember seeing it like that before. Maybe the cleaning crew missed it? We're nestled in bed, this four-poster monstrosity that feels like it's from another era when it happens. At first I thought it was the wind, or the house settling. But then it gets clearer, unmistakable even. A voice, a whisper, and it's saying something, chilling. Help me. Just those two words over and over, soft, desperate. My heart's pounding. I'm wide awake now and my wife, she hears it too. We're locked in this silent moment, the kind of silence that's loud. It's coming from somewhere inside the house. Somewhere close. That's when we realize it's not coming from outside, it's coming from somewhere below us, from the basement. And the next decision we make, well, let's just say it changes everything. So there we are, creeping down the hallway. The voice gets louder, clearer, but it's still just those two words, help me, like a broken record. We find the door to the basement, and it's one of those heavy old school ones that just scream, don't open me. But we do because, well, someone's asking for help, and we're not heartless. I grab my phone, using it as a makeshift torch. The light's weak, barely cutting through the gloom. Every step we take, the floorboards groan under our weight, like they're warning us to turn back. The air gets colder as we descend, the kind of cold that seeps into your bones. It's musty, too, like this part of the house hasn't seen a living soul in years. By the time we reach the bottom, the whispers have stopped. There's just silence, thick and suffocating. I'm scanning the room with my phone, heart hammering in my chest, when the light catches something, something that makes my blood run cold. There's this door almost hidden in the shadows. It's old, older than any door has any business being. It's not just the door, though. It's the padlock hanging open, like an invitation, or maybe a warning. We push the door open, and that's when it hits us. The smell. It's all too familiar. Blood. The air is thick with it. My wife's gripping my arm so tight it hurts, but the pain's nothing compared to the fear. Someone was kept here, against their will, in this hidden room. And the worst part, the part that has us frozen in terror, is the realization that they might not be the only secret this mansion is hiding. So we're standing there in this room straight out of a nightmare and it dawns on us. The whispers, the pleas for help, they stopped. Stopped the moment we found this room. And that's when the pieces click into place and it's like my stomach drops right through the floor. Someone else is in this house. Someone who didn't want to be found. 
We're not alone. The whispers, the crying, it wasn't some ghost or echo, it was a warning. Someone was trying to tell us to get out, and we walked right into the lion's den. I grab her hand and it's cold, clammy. We've got to get out, but it's like we're stuck in molasses, too scared to move, too scared not to. And then, a floorboard creaks. Not the old ones under our feet, but somewhere in the shadows, somewhere close. We bolt. The stairs, they seem miles away, but we're not looking back. Every creak, every rustle behind us is like a breath on our necks. The mansion's no longer beautiful. It's a maze, a trap. We're fumbling through corridors, banging into furniture. But the fear, man, it's like a fire at our heels, pushing us forward. Finally, the front door. It's massive, heavy, but fear gives you strength you never knew you had. We throw it open and the night air's never tasted so sweet. We drove until the mansion was just a speck on the horizon. The adrenaline was wearing off, replaced by this icy realization. We had escaped, but at what cost? My wife realized she'd left her purse. Inside, our IDs, our address. We'd fled the danger, but had we invited it right to our doorstep? We'd been cooped up for ages, and the walls of our apartment were starting to feel like they were closing in on us. So we decided to rent a house in the burbs for a week. A little breather, you know? We found this decent-looking Airbnb online. Nothing fancy, but it had a backyard and enough rooms for all of us. The neighborhood seemed quiet enough. Just your typical tree-lined streets and cookie-cutter houses. So we get there, and the Airbnb is decent. The house was, I'd say, retro. It had that old 80s charm. The backyard was a total win for the kids, a massive tree casting shade, and plenty of space for them to run around. But then there was the neighbor's house. It was right next to ours, just a fence apart. Looked a bit run down, blinds always shut tight. Honestly, it felt out of place in such a nice neighborhood. One evening while we were firing up the grill, I saw him for the first time. He was peeking through a tiny gap in his blinds, just staring, not moving. A little creepy, I'm not gonna lie. However, it wasn't just a one-time thing. Every time I'd step outside or look out the window, there he was, observing, always in the shadows. I tried shaking off the uneasy feeling, telling myself it was just the new surroundings, but deep down I had this gut feeling that there was way more to the story. One night I stepped out to grab a beer from the cooler we left on the porch. The night was quiet, eerily quiet. That's when I noticed him, the neighbor, he wasn't hiding behind the blinds this time. He was standing right there at the edge of his lawn, half hidden by the shadows of an overgrown bush. He stood completely still, his eyes fixated on me. As I locked eyes with him, there was this coldness. It felt like he was looking right through me. My heart started pounding. Hey neighbor, I called out, trying to keep my voice steady. No response, not a word. Just those piercing eyes locked on mine. I took a step back, not wanting to provoke him. Slowly, he tilted his head, almost curiously, like a dog hearing a high-pitched sound. Then he backed away into the darkness of his porch without breaking eye contact, until he disappeared completely. That's when I realized this wasn't your average quirky neighbor. Something was off with this guy, seriously off. After that night, things started to get weirder. Every morning, we'd find something on our doorstep, one day it was a bunch of kids' toys, all old and dirty. The next, a bunch of wilted flowers tied with a string. And then there was this old tattered doll. Its glass eyes looked eerily lifelike, and there was a note attached that just read, For your little one. I remember feeling this tight knot in my stomach. Who leaves something like that? And the way it was phrased, it didn't sit right with me. The kids were told to play inside, which they weren't too happy about. I didn't want to scare them, but I couldn't ignore that nagging feeling in my gut. At night, I'd catch glimpses of him, a shadow at his window or the flicker of movement by the fence line. He was watching, always watching. One evening, while I was washing dishes, I heard a tap at the window. I turned, and there he was, face pressed against the glass, eyes wide, mouth moving like he was trying to say something to me. But there was no sound just the thumping of my own heartbeat in my ears. I'll tell you, nothing prepares you for seeing a face staring back at you in the dark. I jumped back, knocking over my youngest child. 
It was only for a second, but I saw his eyes. They were wild, desperate. I ran to the door, flipped the porch light on, but he was gone. I knew we couldn't just brush it off anymore. I called the cops. When they came, they said they'd talk to him, check in on the situation, but their hands were tied without a real threat. He's harmless, they said, but it didn't stop. The tapping on the windows became a nightly thing, and then the toys we found on the doorstep started to belong to my kids. Toys they'd played with the day before. So one evening, as dusk settled and shadows stretched across the lawn, I decided enough was enough. I marched over to his house, my heart hammering against my ribs. I knocked on the door, louder than I intended. His mother answered, a frail woman with worry lines etched into her face. When I asked about her son, about the staring, the toys, and the whispering, her eyes filled with a mix of fear and sadness. She told me in hushed tones that her son wasn't well, that she was trying her best to keep him inside, to keep him calm. Just as she was about to say more, he appeared behind her, his eyes wild and his body tense. He started shouting, not words, but just this raw animalistic noise. His mother tried to soothe him, but he pushed past her, coming straight for me. I backed away, my heart racing as he stopped at the threshold, his presence like a dark cloud on the porch. That night was something out of a nightmare. I woke up to the faintest sound, like someone was tampering with a window. At first I thought I was dreaming, but then I heard it again, clear and unmistakable. I slipped out of bed, my heart pounding in the silence. Every creak of the floorboards felt like a gunshot in the quiet house. As I crept closer, the moonlight cast an eerie glow through the hallway. That's when I heard it, a soft whimper, coming from my daughter's room. Pushing her door open, the moonlight spilled across her bed, and there I saw him, the neighbor, his hand over my daughter's mouth, trying to pull her from her bed. Adrenaline took over. I lunged, grabbing him, yanking him away from her. He was shouting this wild, unhinged sound that I'll never forget. My daughter was crying now, loud and scared, and my wife was there suddenly, turning lights on, screaming. He struggled, trying to get back to the window, but I wasn't having it. I pushed him down, keeping him there until the cops arrived. Those minutes waiting for the cops, pinning him to the ground, they felt like hours. My daughter was safe, but our sense of security? Shattered forever. The cops took him away, his mother sobbing in the background. I remember thinking, as I held my daughter close, just how close we'd come to a different ending. We left that Airbnb, left that town, but the echoes of that night followed us. We're more careful now, more aware, but every now and then when the house is quiet, I catch myself listening for the sound of a window creaking open.